All right, I'm going to go right into it. Uh, we're going to start out with the Bhagavad Gita, uh, chapter 5, verse uh, 22 through 24. And I'm going to break it down uh, verse by verse as we read so I'm gonna, uh, so we can get it all in context. But it says, Pleasures conceived in the world of senses have a beginning and an end and give birth to misery. So uh, basically, it says, uh, Pleasures conceived in the world of the senses have a beginning and an end and they give birth to misery. Uh, basically, what that's saying is all of your uh, sense pleasures uh, of the world, which would be the first one would be materialism, money and uh, the obsession with objects. So whatever objects you can buy, a uh, house, car, uh, electronics, uh, anything material, uh, even animals, you know, because uh, in the ancient world, they would, you know, buy animals and uh, crops. Everything that you're pretty much obsessed with, even your pet or your jewelry, everything pretty much in this world will uh, dis will uh, decay and will be destroyed. So it's sort of like in a, a New Testament where it's a, a concept, a parable of the whole idea of not uh, seeking the treasures of the world, but let your treasures be in heaven. Why? Because the treasures in, in, in the material world, they rot and they decay. So basically it says the pleasures conceived in this world of the senses have a beginning and an end. So your attachment to it is for a limited amount of time. If you attach to your pet dog, well, it's only going to be 10 years. You see what I'm saying? Uh, if you're uh, attached to uh, uh, your wife, one of, if, if, if a wife is attached to the husband, the husband attached to the wife, well, eventually one of them is going to die. And that's going to give birth to misery. And uh, if you have uh, an attachment to friends, to family, once again, that has a beginning and an end. You're going to have nothing but misery. So if you don't have pleasures in the world, where do you invest your uh, pleasure? Well, you go to the place where you originally had uh, uh, immortal bliss and immortal or eternal pleasure, which is basically nothing but your own true self beyond before you took this human birth. And that's what the whole concept of this text is really going into is not get caught up in the uh, the temporary, uh, undependable, unstable pleasures of this world, but get into the immortal pleasures and the immortal bliss, which you can only grasp or, or taste or even touch unless you uh, practice advanced spiritual practices, which is basically, you know, out the gate meditation. But we know we talk about different types of penances, but basically you have to, you can't knock it till you try it. You have to give yourself the opportunity to, to try to see what level of bliss you can get or pleasure from going within and seeking God or seeking your true self, your higher self. But you can't seek temporary pleasures and seek the ultimate truth or your ultimate higher self at the same time. You can't do it. You have to make a choice. Uh, so I'm going to keep reading. It says, Arjuna, the wise do not look for happiness in them. So the wise man, which is basically, there's three different types of men. I'll be going into this over and over again, but uh, redundancy is what helps us get illuminated because repetitiveness is what creates a habit in your mind. So your nerve be able to, your, your nerves are able to become strong and you'll be able to grasp these concepts quicker. So I have to repeat the same concepts, but it's three different types of men. There's the, there's the, uh, the holy, the, uh, the holy, the good and the evil. Well, the wise man is basically the holy. The good man is basically he's in between foolish and hope and uh, wise. And the evil is absolutely uh, foolish. So basically what I'm trying to break down is that it says the wise men do not look for happiness in these what worldly pleasures, because the wise man understands it is basically a trap. It's an illusion. They're only going to it's whatever type of attachment you have is only going to last from 10 to 25 or something years. So you'll constantly be going through cycles of highs and lows, highs and lows, like an addiction, like a drug addiction. And you have to understand that hit or that drug hit of whatever you attach to, whether it's food, uh, sex, materialism, money, status, ego, material objects, all of those things are temporary and you cannot depend on them for uh, immortal or complete pleasure or complete bliss. Even while you are attaining uh, materialism, it's a thing in the back of your mind where you know you're thinking, do I even deserve these uh, this this level of pleasure or luxury? 
because you have to realize that all of that material success and material objects you've gained at the uh, expense of others. So if you have a bunch of diamond rings and a bunch of gold, well, you got that at the expense of, uh, let's say, Native Americans and Africans who died to be able to have access to the, the minerals and the, uh, the the minerals and the jewels that, that were under their land. So there's a competition over material objects. So either it will cause you suffering immediately to be attached to uh, objects or, or wealth, or it will cause somebody else suffering immediately. But both of y'all will eventually suffer and the wealth will eventually decay. It will, it will eventually disappear. So that's wealth. Now, what about sex? Well, sex, basically, uh, I'll get into that in the future. Uh, if you desire worldly pleasure in a form of sex, well, you got to understand that unless it's regulated on a level of uh, a uh, re on an organized uh, communal level, like a village level, and we're talking about marriage, but not just isolated marriage, but marriage that's a part and integrated in a community. Uh, and that has only only using the sexual uh, the sexual behavior or the sexual acts to be able to procreate and keep the uh, the ancestral line going, the bloodline going. But you got to understand that outside of that, sex is nothing but competition. So. Again, there's going to be people that's going to be in misery and be, uh, uh, what you say, uh, suffering at the expense of you having that wife or you having that girlfriend or, or the girl or, the, or if you're a female, you having that man or you having that uh, husband. So how will they suffer? Because everybody's genes, everybody's born with diverse genes. So in a regulated society or village, these people generally try to keep their genes as closely uh, similar as possible. They try to all look, look the same. That way it would be as least competition and at least animosity, jealousy, envy, and spite as possible. But the problem is that every group of human beings, uh, for as long as humans have been around, uh, the problem is, is that eventually that society will collapse and a whole lot of other people will integrate and you have a problem called miscegenation. And that's basically where you have two different groups of races that mix or three or four groups of races that begin to mix. And that mixture creates diversity. And in that diversity, you have short, tall, uh, dark, light, uh, heavy set, skinny, you know, or fat, skinny. You know, you have all of this diversity, all of these different uh, forms that we take on. And what that causes is all different types of insecurity, low self-esteem bitterness spite when if we didn't focus on the sex act at all we wouldn't focus on the sexual competition so we wouldn't focus on our ego or our self-esteem or we, our minds would be free from the disturbance of competing or whether or not we have have validation or be sexually validated you know what i'm saying so all of that causes suffering because half of the population is not going to get the validation well, I say more than half, basically about 80% of the population is going to want to practice the sex act, but they're going to end up in misery, uh, even if they marry. So, and that marriage or that relationship is temporary, meaning the love and all of the romance is going to die. And your mate, your uh, wife or your husband, if you're a female, will most likely die before you. So it's going to cause misery and suffering no matter what. And the bitter competition between the two, the two people within the within the relationship, the couple, they're always in uh, competition of who is going to have the most money, who is the most respected, who is the one who dominates. So in the Western world, it's causing a big problem because the Western world is about to collapse because of social decay, because of this competition, this gender competition, and the women have had an access of. Uh, opportunity to be, be able to become extremely wealthy and be independent from following any following or letting men lead them. So what happens was who what happens is who's going to dominate the household? Who's going to dominate the relationship? Because there's it's one way or the other. So either the female, the females in society, in any particular society, any in any point of history, they're going to suffer with being dominated over, or on the other side of uh, the, the pendulum, in, in, in other societies, the men will suffer because they're being dominated. So no matter what, 
it brings misery. So don't be attached uh, to world worldly pleasures, whether it's materialism, wealth, or sex. What's the other one? The other one is status. Well, status, if you try to look for validation, it all is all based on flaws. So let me give you an example. Right now, white people are the, or have been for the last 300 years in the West, in America, the uh, the pedestal of what it means to be successful, what it means to have to be elite, what it means to be uh, the social engineers and the uh, the you know the influencers. Uh, and so what happens is you have a bunch of black celebrities who begin to take on the uh, platon and they begin to represent the high status like Jay Z, uh, Michael Jackson, Oprah, you know, all of these different figures. But the problem is Michael Jackson died, what, in misery. Oprah right now most likely is going through misery. Jay-Z, he probably hasn't seen much of the misery that will come yet because, you know what I'm saying, he's still pretty young, like 50-something years old. So, but what you have to understand is all of these celebrities and uh, famous uh, superstars and uh, artists and even uh, athletes like Michael Jordan and all these others, you have to realize that once you reach that level of status, that there is no genuine love or compassion that anybody actually has for you. And really, people resent you or they are so and so infatuated with you that they resent the fact that they can't be around you. So uh, what is it called? Admiration can also be hate. Admiration can quickly become hate. And that's because if you don't. If you're a celebrity and, and I'm walking in your town and you obsessed with me as a, a fan, you're a fan of mine, and I don't show any level of uh, uh, camaraderie or connection with you, then you'll resent me because I basically hurt you more than I hurt anybody else in my life at any other any point in my life. So I'll find myself being isolated because I can't relate to anybody. So that'll bring what misery and my fame won't last forever. Whatever gift I have or whatever luck I've come across to be able to become high level of status eventually because of competition somebody will eventually I'll become weak or I'll lose my skills or my genes will become old or I'll uh, whatever happens in life you know where stuff begins to die uh, the opportunity will come where you where you'll be you won't know you'll no longer be the most famous in that category and you won't have that status so we talking all the way from the highest level of government to media to entertainment and all the way to just the, your neighborhood and your local city, you know what I'm saying, based on status. So it brings nothing but misery. So most of the people I've known that uh, throughout my life uh, that have had a lot of status, eventually they end up just basically becoming isolated and they just start riding solo because they can't trust nobody. And everybody is pretty much in competition with them uh, and everybody around them becomes fake because they can't express who they really are around somebody at that high level of status. So let's go through the worldly pledges again. So that's money, sex, materialism, and status, and ego. So all of that is temporary and it brings suffering. So that's pretty much what the uh, quote was trying to break down. And remember those those three or four principles that I just named that are worldly pleasures are nothing but the first four chakras, right? You can also say they wanted to, they also four chief demons, right? So I'll get into that in the future, but we're just dealing with this uh, quote right quick. That way we can break down these uh, concepts, but uh, let me keep moving. It says, but those who overcome the impulses of lust and anger, which arise in the body are made whole and live in joy. So like I said, in verse uh, 20, that verse yeah like it says in verse 23 those who overcome the impulses of lust and anger lust will be all of the lower three chakras and anger will be the heart chakra so if you're able to overcome anger envy spite jealousy competition and the whole idea of not being forgiving uh, and all of that comes with basically your attachment with some type of of, of these world these world pleasures that we just went over but like I said, all of that has to do with the attachment and the uh, desire for all of those pleasures. I just, you know, the whole list I just went through. That's what gives birth to anger and what gives birth to uh, to lust, right? The impulses of lust. But you have to what overcome those impulses.
we keep moving. It says they find their joy, their rest and their light completely within themselves. United with the Lord, they attain nirvana in Brahman. So uh, it says they find their joy, their rest and their light completely within themselves. Now, that's key. Now, who's the day? It says the wise men. Well, the holy men, not the good and not the evil, but the holy they find their joy, not like the good man, which would be the average common man who finds their joy externally through those pleasures we just listed. But the wise man finds their joy and their rest and their light completely within themselves. So what is that talking about? Well, you got to understand inside of our body, uh, our soul is nothing but a spark of light that's basically within a space of like a pillar within your spine and in that world it op in that space is a whole dimension and it opens up into spokes on different levels of all of these different worlds now you can say those worlds are imaginary but they're imaginary to the extent that you have dreams so in your dream you know you wake up and you try to interpret what is the meaning of the dream well it's the same thing when you close your eyes it says the wise men close their eyes and they find that light and that joy within themselves. So in that spoke or in these, in that in that pole or in that uh, <clears throat> that realm, they try to find their joy in all of these different spaces within their uh, body. And you can call that uh, we know the chakras and all of these other uh, words. But the point is, there's the external world and the internal world. You can't basically have both you can't have your cake and eat it too so you have to decide in your life what is going to be where you're going to get your bliss from is it going to be temporary and eventually the fruit of it will be misery or is it going to be immortal and the fruit of it will be nothing but bliss and it's going to be beyond even your birth and your death it's going to be beyond rebirth and death so the all the other pleasures you have to reincarnate and keep trying to attain a certain level of pleasure through them so you keep reincarnating through your children because of procreation but the other route is you find that bliss within you today while you're alive and when you die your body just decays but your soul basically gets uh consumed or, or or taken up into that space that you already were introduced to while you were alive and we're talking about the seven different worlds. Now, you can translate this into science to the different dimensions, the fourth dimension, fifth dimension, sixth dimension, so on. But the point is, in those seven worlds, like I said, they're within within inside of you. God lives or God or your true self, which is the true self of all humans and all living beings, is within the seventh heaven or the seventh realm. And that realm is the realm of absolute reality and truth and bliss and I'll get into the mythology of how we fell from that realm and we ended up as humans. But for now, just understand this simply as a concept that you want to go like the, it says the wise man would do the holy man and find that immortal bliss with inside yourself by reaching one of these higher of the uh, seven realms. Now, each of the seven, depending on what level, depends on the level of bliss. But the seventh level, which is where the absolute highest being or your own highest self is is the highest level of bliss and it says uh i'll read it again it says they find their joy their rest and their light completely within themselves united with the lord they attain nirvana in god or brahman so they are turning nirvana nirvana basically means to blow out the flame now what flame you can call it the shakti flame the uh the uh, kundalini is many names but that flame is the the heat, the sensation in your uh your intestinal tract, your gut, your stomach, that basically is the driving force of what we might call our sexual desire and our sexual energy and our desire for comfort and survival. Now, that heat creates like a soup and you begin to secrete hormones out your gut, like serotonin and all these other hormones. The point is, is that once you find that light within and you depend on it, you can lift that light and and blow out that lower candle and and light the true candle, which is within. You see, not the fake candle that has you looking outside for food, for sex and for materialism or money. 
but you can light that inner candle, which ha which will have you realize God, which is nothing but uh, a spirit or a consciousness that's within you this whole time. So remember, the body is the temple of God, period. So nirvana is basically a state of consciousness that represents you liberating your soul from the bondage of this body or this physical world, this 3D world, this matrix. And it also can mean in the Hebrew system, you go to the Hebrew, the Bible, it's the Holy Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit. Because uh, remember, there's many types of spirits that you have. You have seven main good spirits and seven evil spirits. Well, you have one that's separated from all 14 of them. That's the Holy Spirit. And that spirit is beyond the duality of those 14. And that holy, holy means to be separate or to be set apart or to be sacred. Uh, the word is uh, kadosh or, or kodesh, right? And that means basically holy or highest or above or not mixed in duality. Well, that Holy Spirit translate that to nirvana. And it's another word called mukti. Mukti, I'll be dealing with these words, but it basically means liberated. So that wise man is able to find their joy and their light within themselves. Not, not the pleasure externally, but inside of their body. And it says they attain nirvana in God. And they're able to become united with God. Because remember, right now we're separated from our own true self, which is our immortal self. Because basically the material world is, uh, the physical world is the very opposite of where the true spirit or the least physical, least dense consciousness is. And that consciousness was before all of this material or physical world came into existence. But we created this world for many reasons. I'll get into that in, in, in the future. But basically, we created this world because that uh, primordial world before creation got to be monotonous, right? Got to be monotonous. And basically, our original self or the highest God or the supreme consciousness was so disturbed that basically it decided I'm going to eternally try to create an illusion where I become ignorant of myself and I'll spend e eternity realizing my own true self. And I'll do this through many illusions and mirages and dreams. And that's what we call our human life, a mirage or a dream, right? But so you awakening to your true self is you completing the desire that the highest Brahman or God had with creating this whole world, which for, which, which was for the sake of losing the monotony and basically boredom and the, the, the disturbance of the a void of emptiness and, and, and being alone. And so what you did is you created a bunch of illusions of diversity, you know, uh, short, tall, uh, human, animal, wife, husband, father, daughter, uh, father, son, uh, mother, son, mother, daughter, you know what I'm saying? All of this diversity and all of these different uh, modalities of uh, experience and relationships, all of that is an illusion. We are all absolutely that one supreme consciousness broken into pieces. But that illusion or that dream comes to an end, not when we die, but when you realize God within. And that's the whole point of this uh, text. But you, but you cannot do that, which is realize God within, but be attached to the illusion of these pleasures externally. Because all they, they, they will bring is for you to reincarnate back into this world ignorant as a, as a baby and be forced to basically become obsessed with these pleasures of the world again, like a like repetitive nightmare. And all it, all, all it will bring is the fruit of it will be misery. You might not know because you might be 20 something or 30 and you don't realize quite the, what the fruit of your actions will be or your pleasure will be. But at some point you'll realize it, you know, and the problem will happen is you'll realize it, but you won't have no knowledge of what is really going on, or what reality is, or where do you find true pleasure or bliss from, or happiness, or completeness, or contentment. And that will only happen when you sit down, detach from the world and all of the external activity, and go within and find the truth. And going within and finding the truth, you'll find out the truth about the external world, because they're very much uh adverse or against each other so you'll be able to figure out the one by doing the other which is going within so with the, saying it that simply laying that down what you reading 
It says, healed of their sins and conflicts, working for the good of all beings, the holy sages attain nirvana in God or Brahman. Free from anger and selfish desire, unified in mind, those who follow the path of yoga, excuse me, those who follow the path of yoga and realize the self are established forever in that supreme state, closing their eyes, steadying their breath, their breathing, and focusing their attention on the center of spiritual consciousness, the wise master, their senses, and their mind and intellect through meditation. Self-realization is their only goal. Freed from selfish desire, fear, and anger, they live in freedom always. Now, I'm going to bring this to a close by reading out the Bible. Uh, I'm going to read out of uh, 1 John. But what I wanted to bring out before I uh, get to that is a few things that we just read. It says they follow the path of yoga. Now, yoga, the word comes from yuk, which basically means to yoke yourself to God. That's all it means. It's not hatha yoga, you know, the stretching and all that. There's many different types of yoga. You have uh, bhakti yoga, raja yoga, hatha yoga, uh, kriya yoga. It's a lot of yogas, right? But basically, the yoga that we're proposing right now is dhyana yoga, raja yoga, and bhakti yoga. And basically, those yogas, oh, and you get ganana or janana yoga, four yogas. That's what we're talking about right now. And those yogas basically are different methodologies to yoke yourself to God. But you cannot practice, you cannot yoke yourself to God or your higher self or the truth by being attached to selfish desires and being caught up in the circus or the gladiator sport uh, externally in the external world or in the world. You have to be able to find a way to center yourself inside of your uh, own body and be content within, right? Or be content without uh, getting involved in the competition. So it says that they realize the self. The self, when it says that, it's not talking about their ego. So you have a whole lot of people that's talking about knowledge of self, but really all they're talking about is being is being uh, not having getting knowledge of their ancestors or African history or nationalism or getting knowledge that they're a king and all of these different things. But that's not true knowledge of self. True knowledge of self is realizing you're not the body, right? It's realizing you're not the mind, that you're not a race, you're not your gender, you're not a human you're not uh, of this world you're not made up of the five elements uh, you're, you're not made up of the four elements what you really are is that fifth element ether what you really are is light what you really are is the highest or least dense concentration of breath what you really are is nothing but supreme and absolute consciousness but you're trapped in this physical form based on your own delusion T for time being so it's just like a dream when you sleep you're what unconscious you're ignorant and you get trapped in a fake body in that dream for let's say a good three to four hours well you're what you really are is god sleeps somewhere trapped in this body for a good uh 100 years you know 60 to 100 years but it's nothing but a apparition or a uh a, a, a projection in a dream so it eventually will decay and collapse and you'll wake up and you'll realize who you truly are, which is not this body. You see what I'm saying? The same way in your dream, you're not that body in that dream, right? So let's keep moving. It says, uh, closing their eyes and studying their breath. Now that concept of studying your breath, we're going to deal with the, the, the science and the, and the significance and the importance of your breath. But basically in the Hebrew in the Christian world, we know there's a thing uh, dealing with, uh, and God breathed the breath of life into Adam. And remember, the Holy Spirit means the holy breath, because spirit, that word in Hebrew, ruach, is the word for breath. And that word ruach is also the word for spirit or for consciousness. So consciousness, breath, wind, and uh, uh, and spirit, all of that, and, and God, all of that is nothing but a vibration of atomic particles that you are using through, uh, uh, how would you say, uh, impulse or a friction of electricity, which is nothing but God or that light we're talking about. So you have to master the breath or become find a way to make your breath of fire or of light or electric. And you do that by purifying what's called prana. There's five different types of prana. And one of them called apana, we'll get into that in the future, you got to figure out a way to master that breath and steady it. 
And once you reach a certain level in your breath, you'll realize your true self within. I mean, everything will become purified. Uh, but anyway, that, that practice is called pranayama. We'll deal with that in the future. Pranayama, that means to control or get mastery over your breath. Uh, but it says, and focus their attention on the center of the spiritual consciousness. So focus their attention. So focus your attention on the spiritual consciousness. Where is that focus? Where is that aim? Well, that aim or that target is within inside of your skull. If I put my head like this and I put a circle right here, you're trying to focus on that true consciousness. And once you tumble into that rabbit hole, you dig into that world, you're able to realize a profound idea of uh, like it's like imagining what if I'm already dead you know what I'm saying like think about it like that like, what if I'm already dead what is before I was what happened before I was born what happens after I die and you able to deal with those profound concepts when you close your eyes and you go in that center and you start to tumble into that the comp the implications of what that all would be or mean uh, but it says the wise master their senses, the senses of the five senses, taste, touch, smell, hear, and so on, right? The five senses. Well, they master them because those senses are the gateway to the external world. Once you're able to shut them down, shut down your smell, shut down the sight, shut, shut down the hearing, and so on, you're able to block out the distractions and the illusion of the external world and tap into the true reality which is beyond all of these temporary activities you know what i'm saying so it says the wise master the senses and the mind why do you have to master the mind because the mind is full of past impressions and obsession with trying to figure out what is is seeing with the five senses so you got to shut that down or master it and make that mind be fixed on that center or that light that we call in god so and not have the mind be jumping and be uh, sporadic and very much disturbed trying to figure out what's going on or how to how to deal with what it remembers from the past, from yesterday or what, it, what it's thinking about dealing with the future. So you got to study the mind and be in the presence of now and not now externally, but now within. And it says, and the intellect. The intellect uh, is basically your discrimination and basically you basically trying to be a wise guy and trying to ask questions about uh what is this and what is that you got to get mastery over that and only ask the questions with your intellect that deal with god instead of how can i get money or how can i get that female or how can i get status or how can i manifest this and, and all of these different m methods and and uh attachments we have to try to uh, satisfy our ego well you got to get the mastery over the senses the mind and the intellect and you can do this through meditation and other penances but it says self-realization is their only goal so with these wise men these holy men with the good men their goal is a house a wife a job status you know all of those things we talked about worldly pleasures the evil's goal is to destroy and to uh, harm themselves or harm others. But the holy, their only goal is neither of those two, which is supposed to be good and bad. Their goal is beyond both, beyond duality. And their goal is nothing but self-realization. They want to know the truth about what and who they really are. And for those who are watching this, what I'm telling you, if you uh, are uh, obsessed with finding out the truth about life or who you are, and that is your only goal is saying that you're the wise man. You are the holy man, right? But it says, freed from selfish desire, fear, and anger, they live in freedom always. So you have to become free enough to, to, to take on that journey or that search or that seeking. You can't be in bondage and think that you're going to be able to discover the secrets that you want to discover. So it says, free from selfish desire, fear, and anger. So you have to free yourself from those four, three to four desires anger heart chakra free yourself from that and fear heart chakra fear yourself uh free yourself from those negative principles uh one minute yeah free yourself from those negative principles and it says you can live in freedom always meaning you become liberated while you're alive and you'll be in nothing but bliss but most people don't realize that you cannot get spiritual enlightenment and liberty and be attached to the material world and material lifestyle at the same time there's no way so 
the summary of this is basically uh, don't be attached to worldly pleasures. That's the summary of that those scriptures. So what I'm going to do now to bring this to a wrap is I'm going to read 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 through 17. And that's going to put every, it's gonna line it all up. So let me read this. It says, this is verse 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That's plain. We literally just went through that uh, for the last half hour. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. So please, uh, I'm going to say this briefly. Please, all of you brothers who are good, who I, who I know are not evil, please stop mixing and becoming uh, hypocritical and mixing the holy with the things of the world or the things of God with the things of the world. And I'm going to be proving over and over again that they are distinctly two different things. So uh, we have to, as a community and as a world, uh, begin to stop being contradictory or hypocrites and allow the things that are sacred to remain sacred and the things that are uh, normal and regular and worldly to remain worldly and regular. But only one is going to be able to liber liberate you and take you into these higher planes that we might call heaven or the heavens. But the other things like money, sex, power, wealth, uh, uh, status, ego, all of those things are going to have you reincarnate and, re and, and repeat your life over and over again here in this uh, material world. So it's two totally different separate things. So that's clear from this quote right here in First uh, John. So let's keep moving. It says, uh, it's, it says, it mentions something about the lust of the flesh. There we go again, the lust of the body, the lust of the eyes. Remember, that's the five senses and the pride of life. Right. It's not of the father, not of the supreme or absolute highest God or uh, Brahman or your true or highest self. It, but it's of the world and the world passeth away and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Like I said, you become what? Immortal. You tap into your immortal self. But it says the world passeth away and the lust thereof. So there we go again. The world is what? Temporary. The lust of your desires are temporary. And the fruit of them or the outcome of all of them is nothing but what misery, but in pain and suffering for either you or for others. And but it says, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Now, what is the will of God? The will of God is to realize God within your body. That's the will of God. For those who are good, the will of God is to, com to complete and do the law. But the will of the holy man or the man who has taken on the new covenant or the Holy Spirit, whatever word you want to use. The liberated soul, the holy man, the wise man, uh, the only will of God or the goal for him is to realize his true self or realize the truth, which is that God is within. And with that, uh, remember the pleasures of the world or knowledge of self or knowledge of God or self-realization, your choice.